Okay, so in the previous class, uh, we were talking about this, uh, how controllers are typically designed, and we were looking into this design of a PID controller for a unstable system. And uh, one place where we got stuck was how do you convert GS into a proper fraction? So I was able to use the long division method to convert it to a proper fraction. And then, as we mentioned, you have to look at the roots of the denominator, um, uh, use the partial fraction approach to decompose this uh, GS into uh, something for which the inverse Laplace transform is well known. And then from that, you will take the inverse Laplace transform and get the GT. So this is where we were stuck in the previous class. And I was able to solve it using, within like 30 seconds, you can do it. Uh, you, you can use long division to convert this uh, GS into a proper fraction. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about, uh, it, today I'm going to do a review, an entire review of the entire class that we have, all the topics that we have done so far, well, not all, but most of the important topics that we have done so far. So this was a class in signals and systems. So signals are what goes into the system. And system is something that transforms the signal. according to a differential equation or difference equation. You don't have to write anything because all of this is something that you already probably have in your notes. So I'm gonna go a little faster in this particular class because we have a lot of things to cover in the review lecture. So one way to think about this whole thing is you have a system and you have an input signal and you have an output signal. So you have HVAC, the input signal is electricity, the output signal is cold air. Well, not HVAC because it, heating is included, but air conditioning system. So you give it an input, which is a, let's say 120 volt AC signal, AC electricity, alternating current, electricity, it draws some current and then it converts that entire electricity into a stream of cold air at a specific temperature. And that's what the goal of a system is supposed to be. It converts an input signal into an output signal. And that output signal can become an input signal to something else and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you think of a supermarket, this cold air is essentially used to refrigerate food items like uh, perishable food items like vegetables and milk and so on. And so that becomes an input, this output signal becomes an input to that particular system, which is a refrigeration, a room full of items that needs refrigeration. So, Therefore, you can actually put system, you can interconnect systems in certain specific way so that you get a desired output, right? So uh, if you look at the oil extraction process, you basically pump water into the um, ground underneath and then you pump oil from the other side and you have to then refine that oil and you have to convert it into petroleum, gasoline, um, you know, diesel and so on and so forth. And, uh, and so this is a very complicated system, but each complicated system is essentially a combination of individual subsystems that are arranged in a certain fashion. And I'm sure most of you will go into industry, some or the other industry, like a vehicle industry or a oil and natural gas industry or a water treatment plant industry and so on. And you will be coming across this 
uh, arrangement of such systems to do something very useful to mankind in, in each of those companies. So you will see it in action in your day-to-day -day life. In the process of studying signals and systems, uh, we came across a very important term called harmonically related complex exponential. Nobody would have thought that these are very important class of signals. Okay, this is the starting point for our entire discussion. So harmonically related complex exponentials where e raised to signals of the form e raised to j k omega naught t, k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, omega naught is 2 pi over t, where t is the period of all these harmonically related complex exponential, and omega naught is called the fundamental frequency. And t would be the fundamental period. So it's, it, of course, by now you would recall that all of the signals that are harmonically related have the same periodicity, which is capital T, um, but, uh, but the term corresponding to uh, omega naught, which is two pi over T, that is called the fundamental frequency and capital T is called the fundamental period for this particular uh, sequence of harmonically related complex exponential. Now, of course, uh, we can add harmonically related complex exponentials and we get a, another signal which has a period t. So let's define a signal xt equals to summation ak e raised to jk omega naught t, k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And it's not a news that this also has a period capital T. Since each of these terms have a period capital T, if I take a infinite sum of such signals, they also have uh, the period capital T. And in fact, if A1 is not equal to zero or A minus one is not equal to zero, then the fundamental period of Xt is capital T. Okay, so this is a no brainer. This part is the no brainer. It's pretty easy to, to show this part. However, what Fourier realized, so Fourier realized, I think in early 1800s, that that any any xt with a fundamental period capital T can be written in this form. So if xt is periodic with fundamental period capital T, then xt is a summation of harmonically related complex exponential. That was the biggest insight that Fourier had back in 1800s. Now that's why this, this result is very, very important. One way is obvious, if you add a harmonically related complex exponential, they would have periodicity capital T. But what is not obvious is that the converse holds any signal with a fundamental period capital T is a sum of harmonically related, related complex exponential. So that was the key insight Fourier had. And this was the subject of uh, study in chapter three and four. Okay, so let me remind you of the key uh, important formulas from there. So AK is given by 
1 over capital T integral xt e raised to minus jk omega naught t dt. See, this is an integral over a capital T interval, uh, uh, an interval of length capital T. So that's how you find the value of ak. And of course, xt is given by this particular formula. So this is the formula for xt. This is the formula for ak. The other thing we learned in chapter three was the following result. If we have an LTI system with transfer function HS, where HS was defined as HT e raised to negative ST dt, t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, then the output is the complex exponential uh, H multi HS multiplied by e raised to ST. So this was called the eigenfunction. And this would be the eigenvalue of the LTI system. Okay, and a similar result also holds for the, uh, the discrete time signals. So let's review that part. So we talked about continuous time, but the discrete time results are also pretty similar. Here, xn would be given by ak e raised to jk omega naught n. K, uh, k takes values for between, so k is an integer, but n capital N number of consecutive integers. So k goes from either 0 to n minus 1. So you can take the summation 0 to n minus 1, or you can take the summation k goes from n 1 to n. Either of those two are fine. Here, omega naught is two pi over capital N. So these are, uh, N is the fundamental period for the discrete time signal Xn. Here, AK can be obtained as one over N Okay, so whatever we did for the continuous time also holds for the discrete time, the integral changes to summation. And uh, there are some minor differences where in, in this particular case, the summation is for capital N consecutive values of K in the case of XN. And in the case of AK, the summation is for, oh, I should write here N. N is for, um, n takes the values for k con uh, capital n consecutive numbers and if you if you use this expression then you get the values of ak in the discrete time case as well we have the same result you give it an input z raised to n the output would be h times h of z multiplied by z raised to n where h of z is given by summation hn z raised to minus n. n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, where hn is of course the, in, uh, um, what is that called, impulse response of the system. Any questions so far on the Fourier series part? So this whole whole stuff is known as Fourier series. This is a Fourier series expansion. And, uh, and this forms the basis for the entire signals and systems class. 
So now for periodic signal, we know that Fourier series exist. You can decompose a periodic signal into some of the individual components in the Fourier series. And you can find the values of these coefficients, Fourier coefficients AK pretty easily. In the case of continuous time, it's an integral, whereas in the case of discrete time, it's a summation. And you have also actually written a code, a MATLAB code in assignment five for implementing this particular uh, for computing AK for a periodic uh, discrete time signal. So you've actually implemented some of this stuff in MATLAB. Now let's think about a periodic signal. Anyone remembers what are a periodic, like not what are a periodic signal, but what was the key insight that Fourier had for extending the concept of Fourier series to Fourier transform. So what, what exactly do we know about aperiodic signals? The period is infinite. Right, so aperiodic signals are periodic signals with capital T equals to infinity. So they are periodic signals with infinite period. So once we take this, viewpoint, we can actually go through the, we can actually truncate the aperiodic signal for a, after a very large time step. And then we can look at the Fourier series for that particular signal and then let that capital T go to infinity. And we arrive at the Fourier transform of the signal. So the Fourier transform X of J omega is given by x of t multiplied by e raised to negative j omega t dt. So that's the Fourier transform of an aperiodic signal. And I can do the inverse Fourier transform and get the value of x of t, which will be denoted by f inverse of x of j omega. This is one over two pi. which is given by this expression. So this is the inverse Fourier transform. Now, of course, uh, we started with periodic signals. So what would the Fourier transform of E raised to J omega naught T be? And one way to extend, like even though technically we can't take the Fourier transform of E raised to J omega naught T using the expressions given here, uh, predominantly because e raised to j omega naught t is not actually an integrable signal. But there is a way to cheat the situation and in fact define for a periodic signal, you can define the Fourier transform as two pi delta omega minus omega naught. So once you have this, once you make this definition for a periodic signal, even though the traditional Fourier transform is not defined, but if I define it this way, I can do the inverse Fourier transform of two pi delta omega minus omega naught, and I will get exactly e raised to j omega naught t. So therefore, this is the convention that is adopted for extending the concept of Fourier transform to periodic signals, okay? So this cannot be, cannot be computed for x t equals to e raised to j omega naught t. So we cannot compute it for such an x t for a periodic x t, but we can define it this way. And everything else will make sense without any problem. Now comes the most important result of the entire signals and systems class, which is, um, Convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain. 
Okay, that's what we studied in this particular chapter. This is chapter five. And something we studied in chapter one and two was if I have a signal XT, I give it, give the signal an input uh, to an LTI, so linear time invariant system. I give an input XT with an, and the impulse response of the LTI system is H of T then the output is actually a convolution of X, X of T and H of T. Now, if I have a complicated interconnection of system, then I have to do so many convolution and it would become a big nightmare for me to figure out for a given input, what the response of that system is going to look like. However, what Fourier transform allows us to do is Instead, look at the Fourier transform of individual components. So I look at X of J omega. This is H of J omega. And we learned that convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain. Therefore, I can write the output as Y of J omega equals to X of J omega multiplied by H of J omega. And multiplication is very, very easy to do. Convolution is sort of a complicated operation, but multiplication is rather simple. Okay, this was the biggest, this is actually the, the most important result, which of course also holds for the, for the Laplace transform. So, Convolution in time domain is multiplication in Laplace domain. Uh, that also holds true for Laplace transform, but this, this is actually the key result which allows us to study this whole theory of LTI system without much problem. And this would be a recurring theme even in your 3551 class or 5551 or any other controls class or signal processing class that you may take in the future. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Cool. So based on this, now if I have two systems, H1 and H2, I know that the overall system, the transfer function of the overall system would be just the multiplication of H1 and H2. So, um, finding the, the response of interconnected system becomes as easy as just multiplying uh, the Fourier transform H of J omega to each other or adding it up and so on. So multiplication and addition are very, very easy operation. So therefore we don't have to do convolution. We can just multiply, add things and we'll be in good shape. So that was Fourier transform for continuous time signal. Then we talked about Fourier transform for discrete time signal. And here, the key idea was, I'm going to define the Fourier transform as x of e raised to j omega, which is xn multiplied by e raised to j omega n. n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is the usual Fourier transform in discrete time signal. And then the inverse Fourier transform is given by one over two pi integral over a length two pi This is my inverse Fourier transform. This is chapter six.
Almost everything we studied for the continuous time also holds for the discrete time case. So if I have an input x e raised to j omega, I have the system frequency response as h e raised to j omega. I know that the output is going to be just multiplication of these two Fourier transforms. Okay. Now the problem with Fourier transforms were that uh, for this, for in order to define the Fourier transform, we want the signal xt to be integrable. And that is a big problem uh, for a lot of situations, especially when you have an exponentially growing signal they are not integrable and therefore you can't really take the Fourier transform of those systems, of those signals. Now there are unstable systems in, in real world. So if we just, if Fourier transform is all we have in our toolbox, then we can't really analyze any of the unstable system, which includes our own body, human body. So I can't analyze any unstable system. So what's the point of developing all this mumbo jumbo mathematics? Uh, if I can't analyze uh, uh, unstable systems with the mathematical machinery we have developed so far. So this led to the definition of Laplace transform. Where we define the Laplace transform as, so I have a signal XT, I'm going to define Laplace transform of xt as xt times e raised to negative st dt. And because of this s, which is a complex number, s is in complex domain. So I can write s as r e raised to j omega. No, maybe I don't want to write it this way. Sigma plus j omega, this is the better way to write it. So I'm going to write S as sigma plus j omega. Now sigma is a new parameter that gets added in my um, definition of Fourier series. So, sorry, Fourier transform. So this, this Laplace transform would now be defined as Fourier transform of xt e raised to minus sigma t. Now, as soon as I allow this addition of a new parameter sigma in my Fourier transform equation, now I can start analyzing exponentially growing signal because I can pick sigma sufficiently large so that my exponentially growing signal when gets multiplied with e raised to negative sigma t actually becomes an exponentially decaying signal, allowing me to compute the Fourier transform of this multiplied uh, multiplication of two signals uh, or a multi uh, it can it will allow me to take the fourier transform of that signal xt times e raised to minus sigma t this again th now this is a big innovation now this allows us to inherit so this this laplace transform inherits all the properties of fourier transform because it's just the way it's defined. And because it, uh, it, it, um, what should I say? It, it inherits the properties of Fourier transform. We again have the same story. Uh, multiplication in time domain is, uh, sorry, convolution in time domain is multiplication in Laplace domain. And therefore, I can talk about the output being the multiplication of the two tra Laplace transforms. So H of S is the Laplace transform of the impulse response of the system. And X of S is the Laplace transform of the input signal. 
Now, once I know y of s, I can use partial fraction to determine what the output of the system is going to be for a given input. And more importantly, even if the system is unstable, this whole equation is very well defined. So I don't have any problem. One important thing that we need to be careful about is to define the region of convergence in the Laplace transform, which is basically the set of S for which integral of xt e raised to minus sigma t dt is less than infinity. This integral is from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, so now there is an additional complexity of keeping track of region of convergence, but that's fine. Uh, I can keep track of it because typically for the signals that we have studied, the region of convergence is, uh, is, is quite large. And as long as there is an overlapping region of convergence for X of S and H of S, uh, we can have a region of convergence for Y of S well-defined. And we can then take the inverse Laplace transform to compute the value of Y of T. The same idea is applicable to Z transform as well. So Z transform would be xn z raised to negative n, n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if I write z as r e raised to j omega, then the z transform of xn is essentially the Fourier transform of xn r raised to negative n, where r is the radius of or absolute value of z. Here, the region of convergence would be defined as Z such that summation of Xn R raised to minus N is infinity. N goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, so this is the natural progression of different concepts we have studied, different transforms that we have studied in this particular class, starting from harmonically related complex exponentials, we constructed periodic signals. Then we said every periodic signal is sum of harmonically related complex exponential. Then we said every aperiodic signal is a periodic signal with infinite periodicity. And then we said, okay, fine. Now I'm going to multiply the signal with an exponentially decaying signal. Uh, and then take the Fourier transform and that leads to the definition of Laplace transform. And once we have developed all this machinery, then analyzing signals and systems, especially for LTI systems is very, very easy. And it just amounts to doing multiplication, addition, and some amount of partial fraction. Okay, so this basically summarizes everything that we have studied so far, as far as transforms of signals are concerned. Any questions so far? Okay, let's talk about systems now. So, so far we talked about signals and one, the two most important signals that comes out of systems are the impulse response. H of T or H of N. And from this, I can use the, uh, the Fourier transform of H of, I can take the Fourier transform of H of T or H of N to get H of J omega or H E raised to J omega. And now I can analyze how H of J omega behaves as a function of omega. So if I take omega going from minus infinity to plus infinity, what exactly is the absolute value of H of J omega? And what is the angle, the phase angle of H of J omega? Turns out that we can actually represent this using Bode plot. Okay, so what is a Bode plot? In the Bode plot, 
along the y axis so there are this is my body plot in this body plot along the y axis i have 20 log base 10 absolute value of h of j omega and i have angle of j omega and this is the body plot for a first order system now there are some obvious things we observe in this particular uh, body plot one is that if you look at high frequency signals if you look at high frequency signals they get heavily attenuated because the absolute value of h of j omega is very very small in this first order system so we notice a lot of different characteristics in the first order system one of which is uh, high frequency signals are attenuated the second is the slope asymptotic slope is minus 20 db per decade. And then we saw that the change in phase angle goes from zero degree to minus pi over two. Uh, that's the phase change from going from low frequency to high frequency signals. So all of this is a very nice characteristics of first order system. And if in case I give you a body plot, it's actually very easy to recognize what the uh, what the h of j omega for that first order system looks like. Okay, now the other thing we realized was there is a connection between what you see in the body plot and what you see as an impulse response and as a step response of the system. Okay, so the first of all, let's let's look at some important things. So you look at this minus 3 db point so that is exactly at 1 over tau and what is tau tau is the time constant for this first order system so within 3 tau so this is 1 tau this would be 3 tau and within 3 tau the system reaches the steady state pretty much okay so this would be my 3 tau so with 1 tau within one time uh, time constant 1 tau you are more than halfway to the steady state, but after three tau time steps, you are pretty much at the steady state. The, the system state is not really going to change or the response, impulse response or the step response is not really going to change after three tau. And this tau is actually related to this particular tau. So there is a trade-off, there is a natural connection between what you see in the body plot and what you see in, as a time response, as a step response or an impulse response of the system. And that connection is actually fundamental. And so if I tell you to design a first order system, which passes very large number of frequencies, but has a sluggish response to step input, it's in, infeasible. This, this problem is impossible to solve because it just doesn't, such an LTI system doesn't exist. And uh, and that was something we studied in chapter six, chapter seven, I think. No, chapter six. This is something we studied in chapter six. So, so this was for the first order system. So the important thing here to note is if my tau is very small, my system responds extremely fast to step input or to impulse input. But at the same time, I'm passing a much, much larger number of frequencies because this one over tau is actually very large. On the other hand, if my tau is small, I'm essentially acting like a low pass filter. I'm passing very fewer number of frequencies, but at the same time, my step response or the impulse response is extremely sluggish. And this is uh, something that we all have to live with we can't really change this fundamental characteristic of systems. We see a similar behavior in second order system as well. So this is the Bode plot for the second order system, omega on the x-axis, 20 log j, h j omega and angle of h j omega along the y-axis. What do we see in the Bode plot? So the asymptotic slope is minus 40 dB per decade. And the phase change is minus 180 degrees. Going from low frequency to high frequency, the phase change is minus 180 degrees. 
Okay, so that's again a characteristic of second order systems. So if I give you a Bode plot for a second order system, and you see these two two things, one is minus forty dB per decade. So starting from zero dB, it goes to minus forty dB per decade, and the phase change is minus one eighty degrees. Then it has to be a second order system. The second thing we notice in the second order system and its connection to the step response and the impulse response. We look at this peak, this kink that we see in the Bode plot. It tells me if the kink is pretty sharp, then it means that my zeta, which is the damping factor, damping ratio is very small. And if my damping ratio is small, then it means that I'll have a large overshoot in the step input. So this is my step input. This is my impulse input or impulse output or step response and impulse response. And we see that for zeta very, very small, the system overshoots, then undershoots, then overshoots, then undershoots, and then eventually converges to a steady state value. So we see this large overshoot and undershoot behavior when there is a kink, when there is a sharp kink in the body plot of the system. And that basically is indicative of the fact that zeta, the damping ratio is very small. So that's another, uh, that's a, again, an important trade-off that you see in the, um, in the second order system. Uh, same thing about the omega n. So this is omega n at which, or around which the kink is. The kink is not really at omega n, but the values are pretty close to omega n. And that omega n basically tells you what is the frequency of this oscillation. Okay, so omega n is related to the frequency at which these uh, oscillations are happening. And that's another fundamental connection between what you see in the body plot and what you would see in the step response or impulse response of the system. Much of this will be again covered in 3551 in much, much greater detail uh, because you will be doing the controller design for first order and second order systems extensively in that class. So a lot of this stuff will be covered again in 3551 and it forms the foundation for 3551. So it will be reviewed in 3551 again, in case you take that class. Okay, uh, I don't think there is anything else that I need to talk about here. So any questions so far on this fundamental connection between what you see in the body plot or the frequency characterization of LTI systems and the step response and impulse response of the system. Okay. Okay, let's look at the the next chapter, which was chapter seven, this is again a chapter where we see the interplay between signals and systems. So in chapter seven, we were more interested in understanding how do we, uh, what happens when we sample a continuous time signal? Are we losing any information if we are sampling a continuous time signal? So we basically created a mathematical model for what exactly it means to sample a continuous time signal. So we have a continuous time signal, we have an impulse train. Um, we multiply these two things and we get a sampled version of the discrete time or of the continuous time signal XPT. Now the idea is how do I recover the XT directly from XPT? So I've sampled a signal, I have a temperature sensor, which is sensing the temperature at every point in time but I'm going to sample it every 100 milliseconds because I don't want to have, like I, I, there's no way for me to send this information at every point in time. So I'm just going to sample it and use a Wi-Fi signal or use some other form of communication signal to communicate this temperature reading to uh, some central location. Okay, so that's where you do this sampling business. So I have the sample signal. The question is, can I recover the original signal from the sample signal? It turns out that if I look at the frequency domain, this is my X of J omega, the, the Fourier transform of X of T. 
And this is the Fourier transform of XP of, J, XP of T, the sample signal. And assuming that omega S, which is the sampling frequency is greater than two times omega M, where omega M is the maximum frequency of the original signal, then I can pass this XP of J omega with a ideal low pass filter. So this is an ideal low pass filter with magnitude capital T and cutoff frequency between omega M and omega S minus omega M. Then I can recover the original signal back. So X of R J omega is actually equal to X of J omega. which means that if omega s omega s is greater than 2 omega m so this is my nyquist sampling theorem so omega s is greater than omega m and the cutoff frequency is omega s over 2 so it satisfies this condition um, then in that case my xr of t is equal to x of t. So actually through the sampling process, I haven't really, uh, I did not lose any information through the sampling process. That's the outcome of, that's the key idea in the Nyquist theorem. And all you need is an ideal low pass filter to reconstruct the, um, the input signal. Now, why is sampling important? Why do we need to sample? So one idea is of course, if we are in Mars and I want to know the temperature reading, so I'm sitting on earth and I want to know what temperature it is, what's the temperature uh, uh, signal on Mars over time. Uh, there is just no way to get continuous information because I can't really have a wire between earth and Mars, which is constantly transmitting me that information. So because of the communication restriction, I have to sample the signal. I have to sample the temperature on Mars and then transmit it to Earth. And then I can do whatever signal processing I want to do on Earth to recover the temperature readings at Mars. So that was one idea. But the other idea is actually uh, in the discrete time processing of continuous time signal. So I have a continuous time signal XCT I have a continuous time signal XCT. How about I sample it, convert it to a discrete time signal XDN, and I can use some processing methodology uh, in the discrete time system domain because I can write softwares which can do the processing for discrete time signals. I get an output YD of N, and then I can convert it back to continuous time to get YC of T. Now, the cool thing here in this whole process, in the process of the sampling, is that here I can use a lot of software to do the processing of discrete time signal. And that creates a huge benefit to humanity. I mean, of course, one of the reasons why we have so many digital devices around us is exactly because of this reason. Because we can convert a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal, I can write a software to do the processing of the input signal to generate an output signal and that output signal then can then go to, can be converted into a continuous time signal and can enter into some other device um, and it can create wonders in, in real world. Now, assuming that this discrete time system, the software that you have written is actually a LTI system then in that case, we can actually relate the overall transfer function of the system HC of J omega, which is actually HD of E raised to J omega T, where HD is the um, frequency response of the discrete time system. So HD of E raised to J omega T for omega less than the cutoff frequency of the filter that is used here. and then it's zero outside of the cutoff frequency. So nonetheless, I mean, the important thing to note here is that if you want to know what the end-to-end -end 
system transfer function is going to be, all you have to do is uh, understand what the system transfer function for this, this middle block, this discrete time system is, and you can easily get the transfer function of the input output system for this overall system. So this is what we have studied in nutshell uh, in this particular class. Uh, it doesn't matter which field you go to, whether you are going to work on a vehicle or whether you're going to work on an aircraft, the most important diagram is actually this diagram here. So we studied all this mumbo jumbo and Fourier transform and Laplace transform only to get to this particular position. And one of the things, of course, so this is a undergraduate class. So all the processing we do in this, in this particular block, in this block, we are restricting ourselves to LTI system, but what's happening in reality is in industry after industry, this particular block is no longer an LTI system. It's actually a much more intelligent system which uses advanced techniques and optimization and machine learning and AI to create wonderful products and services for various businesses. And think of Amazon Alexa and think of autonomous vehicles, all of which are essentially creating AI tools here in this block to create a lot of value for their customers. And most likely, no matter which industry you will go to, this is what you would be doing for the rest of your life, which is convert continuous time signal to discrete time signal, write drivers and softwares for processing that discrete time signal and then you output it to a continuous time signal and that continuous time signal is going to create wonders in the outside world. So that brings me to the end of this class and this lecture. It was a great pleasure teaching you all signals and systems. Hopefully we'll get a chance to meet each other in autumn semester when the university opens up. Um, I'll stick around for any questions you may have, but I'll turn off the recording and uh, wish you good luck for the final exams and hope to see you soon.